Hello, and welcome to POMA Does, a podcast produced by the Pennsylvania Osteopathic Medical Association. We provide a voice for osteopathic medicine and share insights on issues important to osteopathic physicians, residents, and students, as well as those who embrace the osteopathic philosophy. POMA's mission is to promote the distinctive philosophy and practice of osteopathic medicine for our patients, our members, and the communities we serve. Thanks for tuning in. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us on this podcast. My name is Charmaine Chan. I'm a family physician and I'm currently the DIO who oversees the graduate medical education at Nazareth Hospital and St. Mary Medical Center. I sit on POMA's committee on postgraduate engagement, whose sole purpose is to effectively engage osteopathic residents and fellows training in Pennsylvania, as well as administration and faculty members. But most importantly, I am the director of osteopathic education for my programs at Nazareth Hospital. With me today, I have Dr. Beth Vitucci, as well as Dr. Laura Neuhauser. And we're going to be talking a little bit more about osteopathic recognition, why you should choose to start an osteopathic recognition for your residency program, and some of the resources and maybe some of the tips that we have all gathered as we start on this journey. So Dr. Vitucci, I'm going to have you introduce yourself first. Thank you, as Dr. Chan said. My name is Dr. Beth Vitucci, and I am also a family medicine physician at St. Mary Medical Center. I recently joined faculty here in July, and I am the associate program director for family medicine residency and the director of osteopathic education. So we have two residency programs, family medicine and internal medicine at St. Mary's that are both going to be applying for, that we're in the process of applying for osteopathic recognition. Uh, I am also a graduate of the class of 2010 at PCOM, where I went with Dr. Laura Neuhauser. So I'm so excited that we're on this call together. Perfect transition. Dr. Neuhauser? No, it's so exciting to be talking with Beth, too. So my name is Dr. Laura Neuhauser. I'm also a family physician, a PCOM grad, and I work with Geisinger, where I've been for the past 10 years in State College. For the past three plus years, I've worked as an associate for Program director for our Lewistown Rural Family Medicine Residency run through Geisinger. There, I'm also the director of osteopathic education, and then I also serve as the regional assistant dean of student affairs for Geisinger's Commonwealth School of Medicine and our clinical campus based out of Lewistown. Our programs had osteopathic recognition for about a year or two. We applied kind of during the pandemic, so our site visit was delayed. So we just had our site visit last year. I had a couple tweaks to make. So technically our status is initial recognition with warning, but we are going to get rid of that warning part pretty soon. Yeah, no, you'll be fine. It sounds like my program is the oldest. We have recognition for our internal medicine and transitional year at Nazareth. And so I think from what I've heard from Beth, actually, the, the application has changed already. So I just am curious, as we start talking about this, why you guys chose to seek osteopathic recognition in the first place. Beth, do you want to start? So I'm in a little bit of a unique position in that I was also the director of osteopathic education at Suburban Community Hospital prior to joining St. Mary. And at Suburban, we had been an AOA-only accredited program. So when we went through the transition to ACGME accreditation and applied for our programs, it was really important to us that we could continue the osteopathic heritage that we had because Suburban had so many osteopathic physicians come through. So we really wanted to be able to continue that strong osteopathic education. And so we applied for osteopathic rec for all of our residency programs, internal med, family med, and transitional year and did achieve osteopathic rack over there. When I transitioned to coming to St. Mary's in July, I came in with the goal of that we would apply for osteopathic rack here at our program. We are a new program. So the family medicine, let me restate that, our family medicine residency here at St. Mary's is a new program. We are currently with our second class of residents. So I came in to the program with Dr. Chan is DIO over Nazareth, which is a sister hospital and they have osteopathic rec. So we're really looking to bring that in 
at St. Mary's as well. So I think it's really great to be able to allow your residents to have that extra education, especially if they've come through an osteopathic school, be able to continue to get that. And then it also opens up a whole new world of education for our MD colleagues. So we have here at St. Mary's where our family medicine residents who are MDs are getting to participate and learn about osteopathic education, which is really cool. And back at Suburban, we actually had five MDs that chose to go into osteopathic recognition programs as well. So that's a little bit about why my journey and choosing osteopathic recognition for the programs that I've been associated with. Great. Well, when I joined my residency program, I was one of the first DO kind of core faculty. So when I learned about the osteopathic recognition, it just kind of made sense. I was like, okay, this is something that I can contribute and can do for our program. The guys here internal medicine program has osteopathic recognition. So they were really helpful and the system was really supportive. We're very DO friendly as a system in general, and we have a clinical campus based out of Danville. So there's a lot of familiarity with osteopathic medicine. So it just kind of made sense to try to bring that to the Lewistown area. Plus I've been involved with teaching our medical students as a clerkship director for the family medicine, the clinical campus students that would come down from Danville and State College. So was already kind of doing a lot of the OPP stuff already on the ground with them. So I hoped it would be a pretty simple transition into the residency space as well. Yeah, I find that, you know, it helps when the administration is supportive, right? Because for us, Nazareth had a lot of the senior leaders, our DOs. And so, you know, it was like, there's a no brainer to start an osteopathic recognition. And so th that really helps, I think. I think if you don't have a supportive program or administration, that might be a little bit more of a struggle. But also like when I was a student, I had gotten in on a rotation where there was inpatient OMT and outpatient OMT. I really wanted to bring that because I feel like patients can really benefit. And some studies have shown decreased length of stay and all that. And I really wanted to kind of have that. And I agree with you, Dr. Vitucci, like introducing the MDs where they become like maybe a referral down the line or even join us in doing some OMT. It's a great thing too. So yeah, I think we have very similar reasons for starting. So can you guys talk a little bit about what the ACGME is making for the programs due to achieve and maintain the osteopathic recognition? I'm in the process of filling out the application, so it's very fresh in my mind. And interestingly, from the time that I did my first application for a program at Suburban to now, I've actually seen three different applications, so they have tweaked it a little bit. But I think the big thing is they just want to see that you're demonstrating that you're providing education and osteopathic principles and practice, that you have the adequate resources to be able to train your residents, and that you have adequate faculty participation. I think those are the big things that they want to see, just that you're promoting osteopathic philosophy, that you have a planned educational curriculum, and that you have all the resources, both reference materials and OMT tables, so that you're able to provide that training for your residents. And then, of course, with all things paperwork-wise, um, just making sure that you have the right evaluations to adequately evaluate the residents and that you were meeting with your residents to go over those evaluations, to go over the milestones and promoting uh, scholarly activity. And Dr. Neuhauser, I'm sure she has some um, more insights and she just had her site visit. It's been a little while since I've had a site visit, which I'm sure will come up. Yeah. So, I mean, I think, you know, at face value, just reading like the initial requirements, it's like, oh, okay, like this is what we do every day. So it seemed like a given, but just kind of making sure the paper trail was there to like prove that we're doing it and to I guess my DA always said always says like signposts like so like we're doing it but like making sure our residents know that we're doing it or that our faculty knows that oh this is why we're doing x y and z and having that documentation on board so yeah, a lot of like little like kind of detail work, but and that's kind of where we kind of got caught up with and, and we're able to clear up pretty quickly. Yeah, the, I mean, the overall program, I think everyone is on board with and, you know, we all practice osteopathic principles at second nature by now, but making sure that from an outside point of view, those are 
more noticeable, I guess. Yeah, I, I that's so totally true for me. It's all about the documentation. And, you know, actually, I at one point got a little citation about inadequate resources. And I know, Dr. Vatushi, you and I have been kind of back and forth about what resources are available. So do you have some recommendations about resources that you would think would be great for people to have who want to start this? I mean, we made sure we bought, I mean, just the basic books that like we had in school, the atlases and the five minute OMT console. We make sure we had that in all of our outpatient clinics, just for quick reference. The tables, it's great that we were able to get an extra table as well. Um, we had a grant that we were able to purchase tables with too. So making sure we had those ready and available both in the resident space and then in the outpatient clinics to use. And then really just, you know, on the scouring the web for different resources. It's amazing what's out there. I think because so many programs are doing this now, they put together a lot of different resources, but from even just like different universities or whatnot, online resources in terms of like reference materials or case-based learning and trying to like sort that all into one place for ready use by our residents and faculty. Yeah, I would say a big resource that I have utilized throughout the years is the SDOFM through the ACOFP. That's been a really good resource. And then ACOFP also has a video library that you can utilize. It, this year for members, it is free to access that video library. So that's a really good resource for anybody that's part of ACOFP. And I think the, a big thing is just networking, like, you know, reaching out to people that have gotten osteopathic rec and asking them what resources that they have. I feel like everyone along the way for me has been so willing to share resources, which has been so helpful. So just working together, I think, is one of the best resources that we have. Yeah, I remember talking to another director of osteopathic education and he was like, oh, yeah, I found this one woman who, you know, does OMT and she created this curriculum. So I bought it. I negotiated with her and got this discount prize. And I was like, what? I had no idea, you know. So yeah, really networking and all that is important. So I think we touched a little bit on the benefits of osteopathic recognition already. Do you have anything additional that you think is beneficial for the hospital or for your residents? Yeah, I would say a couple other benefits. OMT is a billable procedure. So it's another tool belt that you have. So your administrators tend to look at finances. You can always promote that when we're training residents in this, it's another billable procedure that they can do. And then one thing that Dr. Neuhauser touched on, which I thought was really good too, is the education for the students, right? So we're also a core clinical campus for PCOM. And when you have students rotating through and they see that your program, that you incorporate osteopathic philosophy and you incorporate OMT, they get to see, wow, this is really practiced in the real world. So it can be a great recruiting tool for residency programs too, to recruit students into your program. Yeah, I would say like that one of the biggest things was with recruitment, you know, as a newer and a kind of a rural program in an area people aren't maybe as familiar with, we definitely saw an uptick in residents from osteopathic schools, both in Pennsylvania and outside. And we're looking to recruit local, you know, to serve a need in our community. So that was a great benefit. And I think, you know, when there were maybe fewer programs, students did say like, they sought out programs with osteopathic recognition as a way of kind of filtering through all the different options. So that has continued to be a great benefit and just kind of getting some really great candidates through our interval interview pool. I think it also is just nice to have like a smaller community within a community. You know, obviously, just like your kids, you love all your residents, but you know, it's nice to have like a little pod and, and people that kind of speak the same language, you know, all the little terms that we use, others might not always know. And then just the ability to kind of connect professionally, myself or my residents in the community, you know, through Palma in Pennsylvania, like will help them form those professional network connections. And that smaller group, I think has been really beneficial especially as they're like looking at getting licensure in Pennsylvania and beyond. But this is an additional thing for everything that you're already doing for teaching residents in your residency. So tell me some of the challenges trying to maintain recognition, you know, as you're doing this or applying actually even for the recognition. So I would say like one challenge for my program is that, you know, we're a very geo-friendly organization, but like just locally faculty 
we don't have as many DOs. So at least that are kind of teaching and actively practicing with OMT. So it's been tricky just having the multitude of people like hands-on in different specialties and whatnot to incorporate in different areas. And then probably the other thing that was, has been a little bit more challenging and probably because we're smaller is the faculty development piece because it's you know, me and another DM who does most of our like hands-on workshops, you know, trying to coordinate that, finding something that's convenient, cost-effective. I mean, PECOM's been great at sharing resources and that's a great connection we've been able to make, but still trying to kind of streamline how we do that on a regular basis, how we document it for AC and GME. That's been kind of a hurdle that I've been trying to figure out how to get over. Yeah, I would say getting used to the documentation and the language that is wanted for the ACGME accreditation was something to adapt to. So that was a little bit of a challenge. I remember the first time that we submitted our summative evaluation for ACGME, we had to submit it three different times till we got our approval because the first time it was too detailed that in how we used our wording and then they wanted it very specific way. So actually, if you go on to the ACGME's FAQs, they give a sample of how they want their final summative evaluation to look and then we just use that and then it got approved. So just one of the hurdles was like figuring out that language that you have to use and making all the documentation to reflect what you're doing to meet with what they want. Yeah, I agree. Dr. Neuhauser, I definitely struggle with that until Dr. Petucci came. It was me. And then I had actually two specialists who supposedly were our DO faculty, but one's an intensivist and one's a cardiologist. And they are lovely, but actually having them there and trying to get them, they're not comfortable actually doing those, say, okay, you go do OMT on that person. Or and you think about, you know, out of the osteopathic philosophy they get, but the actual, you know, testing, because one would say, I'm not that comfortable testing because I haven't done it in a while. I don't really know. And they suck it up and they do it. But I agree that is a big challenge. And a lot of places, there are very few DOs who can actually do it. So I feel like in the past with PCOM having the opti, I feel like we have had a lot more resources. Unfortunately, we don't have that now, but I'm hoping that Como will step in and do that for us, starting with this podcast. So have you found any additional other resources or any kind of pearls that you've kind of come across for people who are trying to decide whether or not they want to do osteopathic recognition or any resources that you think that they would benefit from doing? I think Dr. Bacucci, you're mentioning the ACGME website. They require. I would say the ACGME website too. I mean, I feel like there's been a lot more resources added since we initially applied to like every so often I go back and like, it's right there written out or there's an FAQ now, like because it's been around a lot more. And I think a lot of the vagueness has improved. So that's you know, always a great resource to go back to. Yeah. And just if there's different faculty development, whatever your osteopathic society that you're part of, whether it's like ACFPE or ACOI or whichever organization you're part of or being part of POMA, a lot of times there will be resources that there'll be webinars or faculty development workshops where you'll have the opportunity to hear from ACGME or hear from somebody from the OR committee. I've done that over the years. I've done the ACFP uh, program directors workshop where they have someone from the RRC come and just kind of talk to you and answer questions. And I feel like that's been helpful. And then just the doing things like this and networking and reaching out to other OR or other DOE. It's, the name has changed shows like director of osteopathic rec, now it's director of osteopathic education. Just reaching out to other people, I feel like is one of the best ways to get the connections and see how people do things. So how have you kind of been having that program? Program, what do you see have been the benefits for your residents or have they been like grudgingly participating? Because I definitely know I've had residents who grudgingly do it and then others who kind of come around and be like, oh, wow, this actually works. Thoughts on that? I mean, it's mixed and we certainly have one or two residents that kind of opted out of it too, which is okay. 
we're not forcing anyone to go through the, the osteopathic program as interns to be like, okay, I'll do the first half of the year and kind of see how it goes. And then they're pleasantly surprised that, you know, just how much their skills have bloomed with the extra mentoring that they get and how comfortable they are. And so they want to continue. And then we have our first MD that we're kind of going to be onboarding in the next year who's interested in sports med and musculoskeletal medicine. And she just falls right into the fold. So yeah, I mean, there's some begrudging, you know, this like with any kind of lecture or workshop, but I think in general, they go along at least pleasantly. And I'm actually surprised how much they use it, to be honest, like in the continuity clinic, the number of procedures that they've used on T4 for some of our residents is actually really impressive. You're very nice. You allow them to opt out. I didn't allow any of mine to opt out. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Matucci. Yeah, I think that something that has been really awesome to see and get people motivated and excited has been having students and MDs in our workshop because then I have found that our DOs are taking more of an interest in things because they're like, oh, well, like I can show this person how to do this. Like I do have a skill set recognizing that they do have something extra. So just that Dr. Chan and I have combined our quarterly workshop. So we do it together. And at the last one, all the FM residents, both MD and DOs were there. And so you see the DOs from NAS and St. Mary's teaching the MDs who haven't had exposure. And it's really, they get into it, you know? So ha having that, like, I have a sense of a skill that I can use and show people, I think has gotten people excited. I mean, certainly I know over the years, there have been people who say like, you know, oh, OMT, one more thing, like just one more thing I got to do. But I think overall, I've seen a lot of encouragement and having that ability to teach other people, I think is really help people stay encouraged. I think you're so totally right. I loved our last didactics and watching them get so into teaching. It was really fun to see. So you're totally right. Well, I think we're coming to an end to the podcast. So are there any last thoughts or wisdom that you want to impart to people who are considering or who are struggling through osteopathic recognition? I mean, I think it's very doable. I think a lot of it is just stuff that we do anyway. It's just a matter of getting it on paper. And I think that the community, at least in our area, is very supportive. And so like the network and the resources you've been able to make just through your osteopathic career, like I'm totally going to pick Beth's brain after this too about some stuff is really helpful. So there is that support there. Yeah, I would just encourage everybody to apply for OR. I think it's great to have that additional resource tool education that you can provide to your residents and students and combine resources, like reach out to other people and plan to do things together because then it takes some of the load off of you. And it also diversifies the education that you're able to provide to your residents. So I think just being able to work together is really helpful as you go to apply for OR. Yeah, I agree. I felt so relieved when she came on board and I said, oh, now I could have an additional faculty who actually does OMT and, you know, osteopathically and I can have support. Yeah, getting the support and connecting and hopefully maybe with this podcast and something we can start creating that community moving forward. Thank you so much. It's been so much fun talking to both of you. Best of luck to everyone on their osteopathic recognition and maintaining the certification. I feel like GME, you know, they have all the DOs on board to judge our programs. So they have a stake in making us successful, right? So I feel like that's hopefully to our benefit. Thank you so much, both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Palma Does. Be sure to subscribe to Palma Does wherever you listen to your podcasts and tell your friends and colleagues to tune in. Learn more about osteopathic medicine and Palma on our webpage, www.palma.org, and join the conversation on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube. Or email us at palma at palma.org. We'd love to hear from you. Join us next time for another edition of Oma Dust.